very much in New York. Uh, you are originally from Ireland, but uh, we yes. welcome you very much and look forward to your lecture. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, it's always a pleasure to come, and I'd like to thank the organizing committee for putting together a wonderful uh, conference. Um, uh, yes, as Michael said, I work in New York City, but I'm originally from uh, Belfast in Northern Ireland. I grew up there in the 1970s, and I'm excited to be here in Jutland because Jutland was made sort of famous for me growing up by the poet uh, Seamus Heaney, who wrote a poem about the Tolland man, who was a, was a body that was found perfectly preserved in uh, Aarhus, uh, in the 1970s, early 70s, and it was a perfectly preserved body, and he uh, compared the violence that was going on in Belfast at the time in the 1970s to what happened thousands of years ago in, in Jutland, and I always remember the last verse of the, of the poem, which was, out, out here in Jutland in the old man killing parishes, I will feel lost, unhappy, and at home. Well, hopefully I won't get lost in my presentation, and you won't get lost following me. I'm never unhappy here and I'm always made to feel at home when I come to Denmark, so thank you. Uh, by way of disclosure, uh, I've been asked to give a talk on can you avoid sports injuries, so by way of disclosure, I should point out that I have sustained a significant number of injuries in my own past, and, the, uh, and this was all in the first half of one game. The, uh, so the question I ask is, you know, what do I know about avoiding injuries? So with that in mind, maybe you could leave now because I'm not maybe the person to ask about this, but when something happens to you, you tend to learn more about that particular injury. And uh, I have a particular interest in uh, injury prevention. And the outline for what I want to talk about today is I want to talk about the process of injury prevention, then talk about some of the obstacles, some of the practical obstacles that you run into, and uh, you guys are probably more familiar with these obstacles than I am. Then I want to jump ship a little bit and talk about the relevance of movement patterns in particular sports and talk about what plane is your sport played in. And then lastly, I want to talk about recovery from exercise and talk about what I, uh, something I refer to as musculoskeletal trauma or uh, uh, the hidden injury that might be uh, lurking in our athletes. So, Willem van Mechelen in the 1990s described a four-step process by way uh, we can finally achieve injury prevention if you follow the four steps. The first step is to measure the magnitude of the problem. Uh, and essentially, you need to know what the injury incidence is. The next step is to identify risk factors for particular injuries. Sometimes you might be interested in intrinsic factors, other times you might be interested in extrinsic factors. If you're successful in identifying specific risk factors, the next thing is, well, what interventions could I develop that might address those risk factors? If you develop the intervention, then you've got to test that intervention and see, does it in fact reduce the injuries? The problem I see a lot is that injury prevention programs are introduced without specifically targeting, targeting a particular risk factor, and in that sense, I think they're doomed to failure. Um, I have a talk this afternoon on screening tests and the use of screening tests on reducing injuries, and in that talk, I'm going to talk a lot about the functional movement screen, which has become quite popular, and I think the functional movement screen, while a useful test, is something that is characteristic of introducing an intervention or a screening where the research doesn't really back that up. So when we talk about injury incidents, essentially you need to know the magnitude of the problem you're facing. In, in the US right now, there's a big controversy with concussions, particularly in the National Football League, American football. And one of the problems there is they don't know the size of the problem because it's very difficult to measure the injury incidents. Uh, in order to measure incidents, you first need to have a sound definition of what an injury is. And in most of the literature, it's probably any missed game or practice. Some studies will look at a specific number of missed games, say four games missed, that means it's a significant injury. Or an injury that requires surgery might be a significant injury, and you might just look at those injuries. Or in the simplest case, you might just base it on a diagnosis made by a medical professional. Then you need to measure exposure. A lot of studies out there that purport to identify risk factors have not measured exposure, and then you don't really know if the data is correct. 
Exposure can be number of games or practices, or even better, game hours. And uh, even better would be to separate into games and practices, because in most sports, the injury risk is significantly greater in the, greater in the game versus the practice. So here are two studies that I want to uh, look at to make a point that we are limited by what we can measure. So the epidemiologists tell us about how important study design is, prospective, randomized type studies with interventions. And a lot of times, not enough time is spent on what the actual measurements are and who is making those measurements. So here are two studies that are done on professional ice hockey players. And the Emory and Mawushi study in the left, the conclusion is that there was no association found between peak isometric adductor torque and injury. So uh, adductor strength was not a risk factor for groin injury. In the other study, which was from our uh, laboratory by Tim Tyler, the conclusion was these results indicate that preseason hip strength testing of professional ice hockey players can identify players at risk for developing adductor muscle strains. So totally contrasting conclusions. So you look at which is the better study. Well, if you look at the number of subjects in the study, in the Emory and Mawushi study, 1,292 NHL players followed for one season. The study by Tyler, 47 players. Immediately you'll say, well, this is more reliable data. If you look at what the, the measurements of strength were, well, they used the same instrument. Injury definition was the same, and both studies addressed exposure appropriately. So let's go with the larger study. Those results are probably uh, uh, more realistic. And maybe the Tyler study is a type 1 error where they found something, but maybe it's not true in the actual population, in the larger population. But then if you go to see how strength was measured in these two studies, in the Emory and Mawushi study, they measured adduction strength using what's called the squeeze test. They put the dynamometer between the knees and squeeze, and measure the maximum force the athletes can produce. In the Tyler study, they measured hip adduction strength in this manner, and they also measured hip abduction strength. So with this, with this test, you can't do a left-right comparison. You can't do an agonist to antagonist comparison. And also, this is not a validated test for measuring adduction strength. So very different tests. The studies cannot really be compared. If you look at what was found in the Tyler study, here we have the strength results, hip abduction, adduction to abduction ratio, shown here in the graphs. And essentially, the conclusion was that if your adductor strength was less than 80% of your abductor strength, you were 17 times more likely to be injured. So this is a high-risk injury. When you find a risk factor, you want it to be a very highly significant risk factor in order to have a potential to develop an intervention to reduce that risk. And so when you look at the two studies and you're comparing the results, you're really comparing apples to oranges. This is not the same strength measure as this, so the results cannot really be compared. And in that regard, in thinking, we are limited by what we can measure. When you're choosing to do a study and to try to identify some risk factors for a particular injury in a particular sport that you're working with, you obviously want to choose a valid measurement tool. Does it measure what it purports to measure? You want to obviously use a reliable measurement tool. Is the measurement error sufficiently small for you to detect a clinically significant, relevant difference between subjects? But the forgotten part of this is, what is your experience with this measurement tool? Is it a reliable tool in your hands? Are you experienced enough to use it in order to get the results that you want? And in general, if you think of strength testing, we probably underappreciate how noisy the measurement is, whether it's our own variability in performing the test as a tester or the subject's variability in performing a maximal effort. And I use the 20% rule as described by Alex Sapega and JBGS in the 1990s. Essentially, if a side-to-side -side difference is less than 10%, I think that's normal strength. If it's between 10 and 20%, the jury's out. It's equivocal. If it's greater than 20% difference, we can be confident that that is significant weakness, or if it's a training program, that that's a significant improvement in strength. 
I should point out that we did complete the Van Mecklen model, the four-step model, by introducing an intervention and uh, successfully reducing the incidence of groin strains in professional hockey players with a 78% reduction, and I'll talk a little bit more about that this afternoon in the screening tests lecture. So for designing interventions to address specific risk factors, well, what would we look at? Very often we look at intrinsic risk factors, and if you look at the research for intrinsic risk factors for muscle strains, ankle sprains, ACL tears. Previous injury is a significant risk factor. Strength is a risk factor for muscle strains. High BMI is probably a risk factor for ankle sprains. And biomechanical movement patterns are risk factors for ACL tears. But if you think of developing an intervention, well, the first intervention we could think about is proper rehabilitation. Since previous injury is such a predictor of future injury, maybe we should start thinking about rehabilitation, and if we get it right the first time, maybe we can eliminate the risk associated with the previous injury. We also do a lot of intervention type stuff with pre-season training camps with our teams, and that's what I'll talk about this afternoon. What I want to focus on now is this getting the rehabilitation right. Uh, Jesper Peterson and others have shown us that if you want to prevent hamstring strains, do the Nordic hamstring strengthening exercise. And hamstring strains are probably the, in, in, in soccer, they're the most important injury in terms of lost time. But in all forms of football, and I'm going to talk about various forms of football, uh, soccer, rugby, which is rugby league, rugby union, Australian rules football, American football, Gaelic football, which of course is the best sport in the world because it's the sport that I play, they all have significant problems with hamstring strains. Now, the good part about this recent study uh, from uh, Peterson et al. in 2011 was that they showed that using the Nordic hamstring exercise was effective at reducing recurrent hamstring injuries. So they had 49 and 54 players in their study that had a previous hamstring strain. And half of them, 49 of them, they put on the intervention, and 54 of them were the control. And here's the incidence of injury after the intervention. 7.1 injuries per 100 player seasons versus 45.8 injuries per 100 player seasons. So this exercise resulted in a dramatic reduction in recurrent injuries. This is very good news for uh, preventing recurrences of hamstring strains. However, when you look at 7.1 is good, but it's not as good as the injury incidence for those individuals in the intervention program who had not had a previous hamstring strain. It's still more than twice as high, so they haven't got rid of the effect of a previous injury. Another caveat to the results was that an injury was recorded as a new injury unless an, injure, an injured player had reported a similar injury at the same time and the same site in the previous 12-month period prior to the trial. The interesting thing is that most of the people that had uh, a previous hamstring strain in that study had, pre had injured it the previous season. Well, the critical period for re-tearing your hamstring is probably in the first 14 weeks after the injury, when we put them back to sport, or sorry, first 14 weeks after we put them back to sports. And uh, John Orchard and Tom Best had a nice paper which kind of bared this out. I'll not go through the results here in, in, so that we can get through to have some time at the end for questions. But essentially their conclusion was the first 14 weeks after return to play is the high risk period after a hamstring strain. So how do we prevent these early re-injuries? That's when we have to get the rehabilitation right. When we send them back out onto the field for those first 14 weeks, is it safe or are they going to be at high risk of re-tearing their hamstring? In a review article on the mechanism of hamstring strains, Anthony Shaki concluded that hamstring injury prevention or rehabilitation programs should preferentially target strengthening exercises that involve eccentric contractions with high loads at long muscle tendon lengths. Well, how does the Nordic hamstring exercise work in rehabilitation? I have three issues with it. The first is it's a bilateral exercise, and I'd love to see a bilateral hamstring strain. 99% of the time, it's a unilateral injury. Uh, it's a Nordic hamstring exercise is a relatively high-intensity exercise, and it's hard to control. So the risk-reward of using that in rehabilitation is somewhat questionable. And then the exercise also works the hamstrings in a shortened position. 
So when we took that on board, we said, well, let's try to develop a protocol that does what Shaki says we should do is work high loads, eccentric contractions, and a lengthened position. So we had 33 athletes. This is a study that we're sort of most com almost completed. We, uh, every time a hamstring strain uh, comes in, we put them on the program, so we keep adding to our database. But we have, to date, 33 athletes, average age 34, but quite a wide range in uh, age and athletic abilities. 24 men, 9 women. Most of the injuries were grade 2, a couple of grade 3 injuries, and 18 of them were recurrent injuries. With, res with regard to the strengthening component, we broke it into three phases. Early, we do isometric and isotonic contractions at short and intermediate lengths. Then we add isokinetic eccentric contractions at intermediate lengths. And then in phase three, we add isokinetic eccentric contractions in a lengthened state. And here's a video of, on the left, intermediate length. And this is kind of where we do most of our uh, rehab of hamstrings in the seated position. Well. These dynamometers are not made real well for doing this, but you have to adapt it a little bit. This is the length and state eccentric position that we do our final training in. So as with any rehab study, you get some patients that do what they're told and some patients that don't. We had 26 athletes that completed all three phases of the strengthening pr program, and they had an average of 17 physical therapy visits. Our follow-up was good in that four of the athletes, we know how they are two, more than two years after the initial injury. 14, we have uh, follow-up one to two years, and eight athletes are less than one year at this time, but all are more than three months, so they're mostly out of that 14-week window of uh, interest. The non-compliance, well, we had seven people who stopped doing the rehab before they got to phase three of the strengthening program. They either had to go back to college, out of town, or they just said, hey, this is not for me, I'm ready to go back to play. And we have follow-up on them, all less than one year, but all more than three months. The interesting thing is, regardless of whether they quit rehab and went back to sport before we told them that they were ready to go back, we insisted that we made strength measurements on everybody prior to going back to sport. And in the strength measures, we made isometric strength measures throughout the range of motion at short muscle lengths all the way out to long muscle lengths so that we could get a picture of the length tension curve. And here you see the strength results before they go back to sports for the compliant patients on the left and the non-compliant patients on the right. So here you can see they've, uh, the solid line is the involved leg, the dashed line is the non-involved leg, and at short muscle lengths, 80, all the way out to long muscle lengths, you can see that there's no weakness, and in fact, when we get out into the lengthened state, the uh, involved leg was 10% stronger. So we were slightly shifting this curve. The p-value refers to the shift in the curve, greater strength at longer muscle lengths. When we look at then seven non-compliant patients, it's a small sample, which is good, because we don't want to have a large sample of people that don't do what we're trying to do for them. Their strength at short muscle length was even, a little bit lower on the injured side. When we go out to long muscle lengths, you see it gets steadily worse until at 20 degrees, they're 35% weaker, the opposite pattern here. So then what happens when these guys go back to play their sports? Well, with our follow-up data on the compliant patients, none have re-injured their hamstrings. In the non-compliant patients, three of them have re-injured their hamstrings, two within three months and one at four months. That's statistically significant. What would we expect? Well, the lowest recurrence rate in sports like that these type of athletes that we studied played is probably about 20%. So the lowest recurrence rate we would expect in the first year after returning would probably be about 20%. That would mean we should have seen six to seven re-injuries. We only saw three re-injuries and they were all in the non-compliant group. So we think this probably works. Now, many people in this room have available to them an isokinetic dynamometer to use when they're rehabbing their athletes. If you just raise your hand. Not too many. And I've seen that in the last 15 to 20 years. Most people are not using these dynamometers anymore. They're expensive, they're cumbersome. A lot of people say they're not functional. I would argue against that. If you have a professional sports team, the investment of $60,000 should be regarded as quite small if you consider what some professional athletes are getting paid. Some soccer players are getting paid more than $60,000 a week to play their sports, so that's not 
really something for debate. But if you've a non-professional sports team or you can't afford this, we have to think of other uh, ways of doing lengthened state eccentric contractions. Our guys have some exercise. I'm not going to show them here. I don't think that they're perfected and we really need to study them. And I know uh, Carl Astling has some really cool strengthening exercises that do emphasize eccentric contractions in a lengthened state. So now the, the problem is if we, if we develop a rehab protocol, we can put that in place. But if we develop other interventions that we use in training or in pre-season, how do we implement them and get the teams to actually carry these things out? That's kind of a problem that we see in many different sports. And I love this quotation from a Major League Baseball general manager who was actually commenting on some interesting data that suggested that they could maybe pr reduce injuries in baseball. And he suggested that I just don't have the money to let someone spend all year looking into this. And he said this at a time in 2008 when $500 million were spent paying professional baseball players who were sitting on the sideline not playing. So maybe he needs to understand where he actually is putting his money and what he should be investing his money in. How do we get the major players involved? Well, for the, for the players, it's easy. Uh, tell them, I've seen so many athletes get relatively innocuous injuries that puts them out for a month, two months, even if it's an ACL, puts them out for a season. They were good, they come back, someone has taken their place. That person that took their place may have been a nobody and now is a somebody. And so many athletes don't get back and it's not that we didn't rehab them properly, it's that they missed time and they're forgotten about. Uh, for the, so for the athletes, tell them, if you don't get injured, you're going to have a more successful career. If they're interested in money, they're going to make more money. For administration, we need to emphasize the salaries that we're paying players who are injured or the medical costs for the treatment of those injuries depending on the system in which you work. For the coaches, we probably need to get a better handle on the impact of injuries on the success or lack of success of the team and show them that data. If we even just show them the number of games missed due to injuries, they might perk up and realize that they should be doing something about this. And lastly, for the medical and training staff, which is the people here in this room, if we have fewer injuries, we can work more on training and work more on skill development and create better athletes. The crux of the problem is athletes and indeed coaches are prey to fads and snake oil salesmen. And I see this more in professional, uh, in, sorry, in team sports than in individual sports. Individual sports, individual athletes tend to be more attuned to what's best for them. I won't even say what these guys have around their wrist because they don't deserve any more marketing that they already have. What I would suggest is that sports medicine probably needs a marketing strategy so that they believe us and they don't believe people selling things like this, that this is going to benefit their athletes. The problem in uh, American football in the US and in, in a lot of sports is that the prevailing philosophy is the next man up philosophy. You get injured, somebody's going to replace you. And in fact, in many professional football teams in the US, if you get injured, you're not allowed, even allowed to come to the next game and stand on the sidelines. You're told to stay home. They do not want injured players on the sidelines. To them, you're useless, we've replaced you. That culture we need to replace, and I think we need to replace it by trying to teach people that you need to protect your investments. So now I'd like to jump uh, a little bit to a totally different picture and talk a little bit about the relevance of movement patterns in particular sports and what is the plane of motion that your sport is played in. Uh, so I talked about forms of football with significant hamstring problems, soccer, rugby union, Australian rules football, and Gaelic football. Those are common sports in that they're all played mostly on a grass field. Continuous play and all outfield positions involve extensive running. So in those terms, the demands on the athletes are very similar. What I like to look at when I look at these types of sports is what is the pattern of motion? When someone's running forward or backwards, that's sagittal plane motion. When someone's cutting, sidestepping, I think of that as frontal plane motion, motion. And when they're pivoting and rotating, I think of that as transverse plane motion. So let's look at some sports. Now, the, the warning here is that the following slides are not evidence-based and they represent the random thoughts of the speaker. So this is a really highly scientific study. What I did was I went Google video soccer, 
greatest goal ever, Google video, rugby, greatest try ever, and so on, and took one video, downloaded it, and said, let me look at what happens in this. So this is more for the entertainment value than the science, but I think it's quite a useful exercise. Some of us were born before this goal. Erdino, raced by Facchetti. Oh, it's not a bad goal for Pelle on the right side. It's Carlos Alberto. Oh, what a great goal that was! Carlos Alberto! Carlos Alberto! Hopefully some of us remember that goal. Well, what I've done with this is I've broken down what I did, really scientific. I went through the video and went, stopped every second. What was the pattern of movement in the previous second? And the feature in these videos I'm about to show is the ball in these particular sports went from one end of the field to the other end of the field for a score. So it's a perfect transition from defense to offense. And what was the pattern of movement for that particular play? Well here, it was about 65% in the sagittal plane, about 15% in the frontal plane, and about close to 40% in the transverse plane. So why frontal plane? Essentially, if you have to carry a ball past another player, you need to move sideways to get past them because you can't, the rules prevent you from charging over the top of the player, though in some sports you can charge over the top of the player. Also, when you play the ball forward to an offensive player, they have to retrieve it and turn. That's why there's a large transverse play in motion. So now let's look at another sport. This is rugby. I'm actually not a big fan of rugby, but uh, this is actually quite entertaining, also from the 1970s, actually. Chased by Alice Disco. Brilliant. Oh, that's brilliant. John Williams. Brian Williams. Pulling. John Dawes. Great dummy. David. Tom David. The halfway line. Brilliant by Quinnell. This is Gareth Edwards. A dramatic start. Let's go. One caveat I would add is most rugby players since it turned professional are about three times the size of the guy that just scored. But in this particular incidence, we have again a lot of sagittal plane movement, some frontal plane movement, and very little transverse plane movement. Essentially, you have to be behind the ball in rugby. And in order to carry it past someone, you either need to run over them, which is probably the modern approach with the bigger players. But in that game, you needed to go sideways past them. So now let's look at Australian rules football. The team to focus on here is the black and white team who retrieve the ball in their own defense. Watts feeds it to Trengove from 50, just goes for the square. Bait got a hand on it. Bartell will kick that oh. in. That is amazing. To take the game on in those circumstances. Why would you that's do a, it? That's a team under no, no, oh, pressure. no pressure at yeah. all. Just wanting to do what they want. Wachinski. He just runs away from them with speed. He might be 30 years of age. Hasn't lost any of it. Kelly to Ling. Varko's on the move. Set up beautifully. Might go all the way himself. Runs inside 50. Unselfishly. Johnson. Another training drill. Okay, now the key thing here is, again, high sagittal plane movement. Very little frontal plane movement because you make, in that sport, you make the ball do the work. You don't try to run sideways past a guy, you just move it forward to the next player. A lot of transverse plane movement, it was actually very slow transverse plane movement. Essentially, you play the ball to someone, they catch it, they have to turn and go towards goals. Now, to the greatest sport in the world. Omar Same thing from one end of the field to the next. Holding off the challenge there of Vinny Murphy. Two strong men in opposition. Nice pass played inside very quickly by Matty McCabe to Liam Harnan. They're trying to organize a late, late scoring opportunity. Mead needing a goal to carry the match into extra time yet again. Beggy. It's still possible. Foley. Into Gillick. Apologize for the quality. Poor marking by Dublin. And it's Tommy Donis carried it right through the heart to Foley. And not even could the commentator could not even maintain his composure. 
Here, you break it down to the plane of motion, almost all sagittal plane, relatively little frontal plane, and transverse plane, collect the ball, turn, and go towards the goals. What I want to emphasize is the difference between the sagittal plane and frontal plane motions in these sports. And if you look at the ratio, Rugby and soccer have, yes, more sagittal and frontal, but it's a closer ratio than Australian rules football and Gaelic football. I call those two sports north-south sports. Soccer, and to a lesser extent, rugby are east-west sports, uh, as opposed to north-south sports. I think that affects the injury that you see. If we just look at one particular type of injury, muscle strains, and look at hamstring strains versus groin strains, I think of a hamstring strain being a sagittal plane injury and a groin strain, strain being a frontal plane injury. And this is data taken from these bunch of uh, literature from these various different sports. The ratio of hamstring strains, about one and a half times more hamstring versus groin in soccer, almost two and a half in rugby, over three in Australian rules, over two and a half in Gaelic football, but only one reference for that. And then if we compare this to the uh, sagittal, the frontal plane motion, what we can see, or what I see in my wandering mind, is that hamstring strains are pre predominate over groin strains in sports where sagittal plane motion predominates over frontal plane motion. That's not science. What I want to get across is the idea of we need to appreciate what the plane of motion is in the sport that our athletes are playing. And in, when we're developing training techniques, we need to make sure that we're training them in all three planes of motion. The last thing I'd like to talk about is recovery from exercise. And uh, I want to talk about three different areas uh, with, in this regard. I often refer to recovery from exercise as the holy grail of exercise science. We have yet to find the perfect solution and the perfect uh, interventions for optimizing exercise recovery. Now, we do know a lot. I'm definitely not an expert in nutrition, but I know that the research has very well established the optimal interventions before a game, during a game, after a game, in terms of glycogen a repletion and protein resynthesis. However, there's parts of recovery that we don't appreciate. And it's well, uh, I, I like this quote from uh, Burke and BGSM in 2010, where she states that specific nutritional strategies to promote or preserve optimal antioxidant and immune function in athletes are not well understood. And I think that's why we have terms like burnout, overtraining, flat, staleness, underperformance, or bounce, which is a term from the horse racing industry. I like the term subclinical musculoskeletal trauma. And I think the things we need to measure in this regard are muscle damage, inflammation, oxidative stress. And these probably are factors that contribute to the things where we see unexplained performance decrement, unrecognized overuse injury, and increased risk of acute injury. In terms of subclinical musculoskeletal trauma, I call this the hidden injury. I'm interested in sports and recovery from sports where there's high physical contact, multiple games with long seasons, and prolonged travel, especially across multiple time zones. And I think a combination of these factors really impairs recovery. The best study that kind of highlights what I'm trying to get to when I call this the hidden injury is a study by DuPont in 2010, the American Journal of Sports Medicine. And what they looked at was in the soccer schedule in European soccer, sometime, mostly you have two games a week, but a lot of times you have only one game a week. The less successful teams tend to have one game a week because they may not be playing in the Champions League or other competitions. So this team, they were interested in, is there a difference in performance and injury if you're playing two games a week versus one game a week? And their conclusions with regard to performance was that there was no significant difference in terms of total distance covered, high intensity distance, sprint distance, and number of sprints between G1 and G2, meaning if you played one game in the week or this was your second game in the week. Their conclusion was that the players had recovered sufficiently to meet the physiological demands of the game despite the shorter recovery period. And that's because they had a very good nutritional program going with the team. They were providing them with appropriate carbohydrates pre and post game and appropriate protein. Their diet, they understood that element of recovery they had satisfied and were meeting it quite well. However, if you look at the injury rate, 
in this situation. And just look at total injuries. If you only played one game in the week, so you hadn't played in the previous seven days, your injury instance was 4.1 per 1,000 hours. If you played two games in the week, in that second game, your injury instance was 25.6 injuries per 1,000 hours. That's a relative risk of 6.2. That high relative risk, that's something you can address with an intervention. So their conclusions were, the recovery time between two matches, 72 to 96 hours, it appears to be sufficient to maintain the level of physical performance tested, but is not long enough to maintain a low injury rate. The present data highlight the need for player rotation and for improved recovery strategies to maintain a low injury rate among athletes during periods with congested match fixtures. So there's two things they suggest, player rotation and improved recovery. Let's talk about player rotation first. Essentially, player rotation, you want to decrease the load imposed on the athlete. So if you rotate the players, you need a large squad, and you need to spread the load among players. Um, and actually, I w went to watch Liverpool play Arsenal last night, and it was a pretty important match for Liverpool. And they rested... Uh, one of their better players, uh, Skirtle, central defender, and uh, I was surprised. He was on the subs bench, and that's the kind of thing that you have to do. At certain times in the season, you have to rest your better players. You can't impose too much of a load on them. Uh, a lot of sports are using GPS data to measure distance covered sprints, and that was what was used in the study, the DuPont study that I referenced. The thing is, if you look at the miles covered in particular sports, it's not that impressive in terms of the physiological demand. I'm more interested in accelerometer data, uh, because I think it's the stops, the starts, and the hits that really take their toll on the athletes over the length of a season. And we're starting to play around with this with some accelerometers. And the measurement I'm trying to come up with is G-force exposure of the athletes. So what we have, you know, there, you can buy a, an accelerometer with a, uh, like a catapult system, which costs, I think, $6,000 a player. That's not really feasible, and it gives you too much data. This costs uh, 95 pounds sterling. And here, this is an elite athlete, formerly, this is me. And I put it on the low back. And here, uh, there's a little adapter. You don't actually need to cover this. Or you can cover that. It's also waterproof. And what we did was, this is not me now, this is a real athlete, college ice hockey player. If the NHL hadn't have been on strike for the last four months, I would have had NHL data for you. But you have to go with this. So here's the raw data. Accelerations in three planes of motion. And you can see this is the period between the first period and the second period, between the second period and the third period, end of the game. This is actually the warm-up. This is the start of the game. And the spikes correspond with uh, different, if I blew it up, you'd be able to see different shifts that this individual was in. So it, you get all this data. This usually makes my computer crash when I download this data. So we're looking at better ways of handling. But essentially, I'm, all I'm interested in is the high load data. So if we break it down to the sum of the absolute values in all three axes, and just look at low load being less than 2 Gs, moderate load being 2 to excuse me, two to three Gs, and high load being greater than three Gs. This particular athlete spent 1.5 minutes of time in this game with an exposure of greater than three Gs on their body. So here is a comparison to a recreational hockey player, uh, and he had 0.4 minutes at high load, 3.3 minutes at moderate load. The guy I just showed you at 1.5 minutes at high load. Markedly higher high load exposure at a higher level of competition. That makes sense. Now, if you look at another college hockey player in the same team, when we got this data, this is the data that I just showed you, 1.5 minutes at high load. I asked, what type of player was he? Well, he's a defenseman, and he doesn't really get too involved. He's not like the most physical player, and he's not that fast. So, well, let's put it on a fast guy the next time. So we put it on a forward, and he came off the ice, and he said, I think I got you some good data there. And uh, he'd done a lot of action, a lot of hitting, and sure enough, 2.7 minutes at high load. This may not seem like a lot of time, but at greater than 3 Gs, this is probably a lot of stress on the body. So this is something where we might be able to apply this. It's simple enough that you could put it on athletes. It's cheap enough that you can put it on athletes, and you could record exposure over a season without having needing too much manpower and without 
uh, needing to hire a whole staff to collect the data. It's a possibility. The last thing I'd like to talk about is improving recovery. So that refers to addressing and decreasing the load on the player. What about this recovery to promote or preserve optimal antioxidant and immune function in athletes? And what I call a terrible triad of recovery, inflammation, oxidative stress, and muscle damage. Well, I, I wrote a review in the Green Journal recently talking about the health benefits of cherries and potential applications. We say life is a bowl of cherries. For exercise, or is a bowl, uh, for exercise recovery, uh, it's probably two bowls of cherries is the right dose. I should give a disclosure conflict of interest that I am paid by one of the companies in the US that makes cherry juice, but there are other companies, and in the UK, uh, there's one company that have been providing cherry juice to their cycling team, which to my mind isn't even the optimal sport for that, for probably the last seven years they've been uh, doing this. Here are a list, you're not supposed to be able to read this, but, oh, it displays actually better than I thought. But essentially, this is a list of 11 studies that have been done since 2003 addressing either anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, muscle recovery, sleep improving, or pain mediating effects of cherries. And I'll, in the interest of time, I'm just going to briefly show you that the evidence is out there. Here's anti-inflammatory effects. Four studies have shown uh, decreases in C-reactive protein in uh, athletes and in healthy individuals without an intervention, and in patients with knee osteoarthritis. Also, one of the studies showed post-exercise interleukin-6 uh, was decreased as well. Two studies showed no anti-inflammatory effects. This study in racehorses uh, lo looked at serum amyloid A. Uh, we were really supposed to look at IL-6, but they decided not to at the last minute not a great measure of exercise-induced inflammation. It wasn't increased in either the control or juice trials. And in this study, there was no change in C-reactive protein in either the placebo or the juice, and it was because it was a single, uh, it was actually lower extremity muscle damage model, but it was a single muscle model where you need a whole, body, whole muscle model to really see some elevations in C-reactive protein. In terms of antioxidant effects, the... Um, Positive studies have shown decreases in isoprostanes, decreases in DNA oxidation, and this was in healthy elderly individuals where oxidative stress is supposed to be a major problem. Uh, in athletes, we've shown decreased T-bars and increased total antioxidant status in marathon runners dosed for four days before a race. And in an exercise single muscle group exercise model, decreased protein carbonyls after exercise, decreased uh, oxidation of protein. Two studies showed no antioxidant effects of cherries, cherry juice. Uh, these are all different cherry juice studies. Uh, the resource study, no effect on T-bars. And in the Botel study, which was a single muscle group muscle damage model, uh, when they gave the people, they preloaded them with cherry juice, they didn't see an increase in total antioxidant status, even though with a different juice, the Hodgson study showed about a 10 to 15% increase in total antioxidant status. Muscle recovery effects. All three studies that have looked at strength after damaging exercises have shown, and they're all randomized uh, designs, they've all shown decreased strength loss in the juice versus the placebo, and pretty well controlled trials. No study as yet has shown no effect on strength. In terms of pain and muscle enzyme reducing effects, the results are more mixed. Yes, two studies have shown reduced pain, but two other studies have shown no pain re reduction. The only study to show a decrease in the enzyme levels was a very small resource study and showed lower CK and AST levels. And uh, in the human studies, we haven't seen an effect on CK and LDH. Now I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about sleep and recovery. Uh, I don't know if Rodney Dangerfield is a well-known comedian here. He died recently, but his mantra was, I get no respect. Well, I think of sleep as the Rodney Dangerfield of exercise recovery. It gets no respect. We need to really appreciate sleep impairments and what they do to recovery and exercise, and we're not good at measuring this right now. But in terms of the cherry juice research, two studies on two, two different cherry juices have both shown efficacy with improving sleep patterns. The first study was in insomniacs, and the second study was healthy college uh, students. And both in the, in the 
College study had showed that giving cherry juice improved melatonin levels, which uh, also resulted in improved sleep efficiency. And in the insomniacs, the people with a pathology, there was decrease in the insomnia severity in these double-blind randomized trials. So to summarize, so that we maybe have some time for questions, how do we avoid sports injuries? You need to know the size of the problem before you can fix it. Measure injury incidents. In terms of identifying risk factors, avoid putting the horse before the cart. Don't just introduce an, in, uh, an intervention to prevent injuries without figuring out what interventions you're targeting. I think some of the 11 plus research, the stuff that works is showing that it's reducing knee injuries. I think of the 11 plus intervention as preventing ligament injuries in the knee. It's not going to prevent muscle strains and the data is going to show that. Maximize the bang for your buck. And this afternoon when I talk about the functional movement screen and whether it's a, a successful at identifying risk, it might be, probably isn't, but it might be, but at best the relative risk is less than two. If you think about the two games a week in soccer, the relative risk there was six. That's big. That's something we can address. We, we will, if we develop an intervention, player rotation, decrease the load on the player. You've got more success reducing a relative risk from six to something lower than if your relative risk is only two. If you follow the Van Mecklen model and the two studies that we've used that model with, we've, in both studies, it's between a 70 and 80 percent reduction in injury. So we think if you follow the steps, you get success. And then finally, with respect to recovery, it's not just about glycogen and protein. It's about sleep, it's about inflammation, oxidative stress, and muscle damage and they are probably linked to muscle in or sorry not muscle injury they are probably linked to musculoskeletal injuries that's why we're seeing more injuries when you play two games a week versus one game a week and on that I'd like to thank you for uh, listening to me and I'm planning on an injury free 2013 thank you